Lincoln on the Kitman have managed to create the world's first truly global empire, and it's basically a secret empire. We do it many ways, but, but, but principally, uh, we identify a country that has resources our corporations covet, like oil, range a huge loan to that country from the World Bank or one of its sisters. The money never actually goes to the country. It goes to our own corporations to build big infrastructure projects in that country that help a few very wealthy people but don't benefit the majority of the people who are too poor to buy electricity or have cars to drive on the highways, and yet they're left holding a huge debt that they can't repay. So we go back at some point and say, you know, you can't pay your debts. Give us a pound of flesh. Sell your oil real cheap to our oil companies. Vote with us on the next critical UN vote. Allow us to build a military base in your backyard. Something along these lines. And when we fail, the jackals go in and either overthrow or assassinate these leaders. And if the jackals fail, as they did in, in, in Iraq, then they'll be sent in the military. I don't think the failure is capitalism. I think it's a specific kind of capitalism that we've developed. We've created what I consider a mutant viral form of capitalism. And this mutant form of capitalism, which I think is really a predatory form of capitalism, has created an extremely unstable, unsustainable, unjust, and, and very, very dangerous world. Uh, I've met a lot of terrorists. I've interviewed them for books. I've never met one who wanted to be a terrorist. They're desperate people. If we want to get rid of terrorism, we must get rid of the root causes, that cancer that is destroying uh, our whole system. Because I think it's really important that we understand today we cannot have homeland security unless we understand that the whole planet is our homeland. The corporatocracy is this group of individuals who run our biggest corporations, and they really act as the emperor of this empire. Um, they control our media, either through direct ownership or advertising. They control most of our uh, politicians because they finance their campaigns either through their corporations or through personal contributions that come out of the corporations. They're not elected, and they don't serve a limited term, they don't report to anybody. And at the very top of the corporatocracy, you really can't tell whether a person's working for a private corporation or the government because they're always moving back and forth. So, you know, you've got a guy who one moment is the president of, uh, of a big construction company like Halliburton and, and the next moment he's vice president of the United States or the president who is in the oil business. And, and this is true whether you've got Democrats or Republicans in the office. You have the moving back and forth through the revolving door. And in a way, um, our government is, is invisible a lot of the time and its policies are carried out by our corporations on one level or another. And then again, the policies of the government are basically forged by the corporatocracy and then presented to the government. They become government policy. So it's an incredibly cozy relationship. This isn't a conspiracy theory type of thing. These people don't have to get together and, and plot to do things. They all basically work under one primary assumption, and that is that they must maximize profits regardless of the social and environmental costs. This process of manipulation by the corporatocracy through the use of debt, bribery, and political overthrow is called globalization. Just as the Federal Reserve keeps the American public in a position of indentured servitude through perpetual debt, inflation, and interest, the World Bank and IMF serve this role on a global scale. The basic scam is simple. Put a country in debt either by its own indiscretion or through corrupting the leader of that country, then impose conditionalities or structural adjustment policies often consisting of the following currency devaluation when the value of a currency drops so does everything valued in it this makes indigenous resources available to predator countries at a fraction of their worth large funding cuts for social programs these usually include education and health care compromising the well-being and integrity of the society, leaving the public vulnerable to exploitation. Privatization of state-owned enterprises. This means that socially important systems can be purchased and regulated by foreign corporations for profit. 
For example, in 1999, the World Bank insisted that the Bolivian government sell the public water system of its third largest city to a subsidy of the U.S. corporation Bechtel. As soon as this occurred, water bills for the already impoverished local residents skyrocketed. It wasn't until after a full-blown revolt by the people that the Bechtel contract was nullified. Then there is trade liberalization or the opening up of the economy through removing any restrictions on foreign trade. This allows for a number of abusive economic manifestations, such as transnational corporations bringing in their own mass-produced products, undercutting the indigenous production and ruining local economies. An example is Jamaica, which, after accepting loans and conditionalities from the World Bank, lost its largest cash crop markets due to competition with Western imports. Today, countless farmers are out of work, for they are unable to compete with the large corporations. Another variation is the creation of numerous seemingly unnoticed, unregulated, inhumane sweatshop factories, which take advantage of the imposed economic hardship. Additionally, due to production deregulation, environmental destruction is perpetual as a country's resources are often exploited by the indifferent corporations while outputting large amounts of deliberate pollution. The largest environmental lawsuit in the history of the world today is being brought on behalf of 30,000 Ecuadorian Amazonian people against Texaco, which is now owned by Chevron. So today it's against Chevron, but for activities conducted by Texaco. They estimated to be more than 18 times what the Exxon Valdez dumped into the coast of Alaska. In the case of Ecuador, it wasn't an accident. The oil companies did it intentionally. They knew they were doing it to save money out there rather than, rather than arranging for a proper disposal. Furthermore, a cursory glance at the performance record of the World Bank reveals that the institution, which publicly claims to help poor countries develop and alleviate poverty, has done nothing but increase poverty and the wealth gap, while corporate profits soar. In 1960, the income gap between the fifth of the world's people in the richest countries versus the fifth in the poorest countries was 30 to 1. By 1998, it was 74 to 1. While global GNP rose 40 percent between 1970 and 1985, those in poverty actually increased by 17 percent while from 1985 to 2000 those living on less than one dollar a day increased by 18 percent. Even the Joint Economic Committee of the US Congress admitted that there is a mere 40 percent success rate of all World Bank projects. In the late 1960s the World Bank intervened in Ecuador with large loans. During the next 30 years poverty grew from 50 percent to 70 percent under or unemployment grew from 15 to 70 percent. Public debt increased from 240 million to 16 billion, while the share of resources allocated to the poor went from 20 percent to 6 percent. In fact, by the year 2000, 50 percent of Ecuador's national budget had to be allocated for paying its debts. It is important to understand the World Bank is, in fact, a U.S. bank, supporting U.S. interests. For the United States holds veto power over decisions, as it is the largest provider of capital. And where did it get this money? You guessed it. It made it out of thin air through the fractional reserve banking system. Of the world's top 100 economies, as based on annual GDP, 51 are corporations, and 47 of that 51 are US based. Walmart, General Motors and Exxon are more economically powerful than Saudi Arabia, Poland, Norway, South Africa, Finland, Indonesia and many others. And as protective trade barriers are broken down, currencies tossed together and manipulated in floating markets and state economies overturned in favor of open competition and global capitalism, the empire expands. You get up on your little 21-inch screen and howl about America and democracy. There is no America. There is no democracy. 
There is only IBM and ITT and AT&T and DuPont, Dow, Union Carbide and Exxon. Those are the nations of the world today. What do you think the Russians talk about in their councils of state? Karl Marx? They get out their linear programming charts, statistical decision theories, min and max solutions, and compute the price cost probabilities of their transactions and investments, just like we do. We no longer live in a world of nations and ideologies, Mr. Beale. The world is a college of corporations inexorably determined by the immutable bylaws of business. The world is a business, Mr. Beale. Taken cumulatively, the integration of the world as a whole, particularly in terms of economic globalization and the mythic qualities of free market capitalism, represents a veritable empire in its own right. Few have been able to escape the structural adjustments and conditionalities of the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, or the arbitrations of the World Trade Organization, those international financial institutions that, however inadequate, still determine what economic globalization means. Such is the power of globalization that within our lifetime we are likely to see the integration, even if unevenly, of all national economies in the world into a single global, free market system. The world is being taken over by a handful of business powers who dominate the natural resources we need to live while controlling the money we need to obtain these resources. The end result will be world monopoly, based not on human life, but financial and corporate power. These so-called counter-terrorism measures, of course, have nothing to do with social protection, and everything to do with preserving the establishment amongst the growing anti-American sentiment both domestically and internationally, which is legitimately founded on the greed-based corporate empire expansion that is exploiting the world. The true terrorists of our world do not meet at the docks at midnight or scream Allah Akbar before some violent action. The true terrorists of our world wear $5,000 suits and work in the highest positions of finance, government, and business. So, what do we do? How do we stop a system of greed and corruption that has so much power and momentum? How do we stop this aberrant group behavior which feels no compassion for, say, the millions slaughtered in Iraq and Afghanistan, so the corporatocracy can control energy resources and opium production for Wall Street profit?